Good morning, and welcome to the international stage of the National Book Festival. This is my favorite stage to introduce, and so I hope you have a wonderful day hearing from your favorite authors. I'm Jane McAuliffe, Senior Advisor to the Librarian of Congress. And as you've just heard, the Library of Congress is bringing this festival to you for the 19th year. When we started this program 19 years ago, I don't think anybody thought we were gonna be approaching our 20th anniversary in just one year. We have an amazing lineup of authors on this stage today, and they come to us from around the world. Their appearances are made possible through the generosity of several embassies, and I especially wanna thank the embassies of Australia, Canada, Germany, Ireland, Latvia, and Peru for making this international stage possible. Our first panel today comprises Aboriginal writers from Australia. And obviously we're delighted to have a representative of the Australian Embassy here with us this morning. This is the second time the National Book Festival has welcomed these special Australian authors. And the first occasion garnered such great audience enthusiasm that we've been, able, we've been really eager to repeat that success. So let me just say a word or two about our panelists today. Janine Lane was born in New South Wales. She's been writing since she was a child. In her, in her own words, she says, I wrote mainly as a way of remembering. After a long career as a secondary school teacher, she worked with aborig Aboriginal students entering university programs and taught indigenous education to mainly non-Aboriginal student teachers. Her first book of poetry run, won the 2010 Scanlon Prize for Indigenous Poetry. Her latest book of poetry is entitled Walk Back Over. Brenton McKenna is from Western Australia. Brenton has said that he struggled with reading and writing until a comic book he picked up when he was 10 changed his life. An author illustrator, he now creates his own graphic novels finding inspiration in ghost stories, folklore, and mythologies. Brenton is recognized as Australia's first indigenous graphic novelist. He's recently published the third graphic novel in his Abby's Underdog series. Kim Scott, <laughs> there we go. Good promotion right now. <laughs> Kim Scott was born in Perth. He has published five novels, most recently, Taboo. His first two novels, True Country and Banang, deal with Aboriginal self-identity. Kim was the first indigenous writer to receive the Miles Franklin Award, a prize given annually to, and I quote, a novel which is, the, which is of the highest literary merit and presents Australian life in any of its phases. And our panel will be moderated by Belinda Wheeler. Originally from Australia, Belinda earned her PhD from Southern Illinois University. And her research interests include, obviously, Australian Aboriginal literature, African American literature, and 20th century American literature. She is currently on the faculty of Claflin University in South Carolina, and her book, Companion to Australian Aboriginal Literature has been influential in, in introducing Aboriginal literature to many more readers. So please welcome Janine, Brenton, Kim, and Belinda. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, Jane. My name is Beck Allen and I have the pleasure of running the Cultural Affairs Program at the Embassy of Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered here today, the land of the Piscataway tribe, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. Australia is proudly home to the world's oldest continuing culture. For over 60,000 years, our vast continent has held and nurtured the stories, song lines, and dance lines of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Today, the Embassy of Australia is honored to be sponsoring this panel the view from country. Our visiting authors have collectively traveled over 25,000 miles to be with you today. 
2019 is the United Nations Year of Indigenous Languages. Australia is home to 160 First Nations languages. Today you will hear from Wiradjuri, Noongar and Yaru writers. Story and place are what connects us all. So thank you to Dr Hayden, Marie and their team for bringing together our story makers and truth tellers. We also hope to see you all this afternoon at 4 p.m. on the teen stage where another Aussie novelist, Marcus Zuzak, will be appearing. Enjoy the festival and now over to Dr. Belinda Wheeler. Thank you. G'day everyone. Thank you so much for coming um, this morning to listen to these phenomenal authors. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I am originally from Australia, but for the last 19 years, the United States has been my home, um, specifically South Carolina and Claflin University. Um, although I'm not Indigenous myself, um, I have grown up loving Indigenous Australian literature ever since I can remember. Um, I love the, the themes, the diverse genres, the, the storytelling, the truth-telling that Indigenous Australian authors um, share with Indigenous and non-Indigenous readers. Um, so I'm very passionate about Indigenous Australian literature and my first two books that I published, um, one was with Janine here on the stage. Um, she contributed a chapter to my first um, companion to Australian Aboriginal literature and after the success of that book, um, one of the Australian uh, Indigenous authors that I've loved for the longest time, uh, Kim Scott, who I'm honoured to have here on this panel as well. Um, my second book was actually devoted specifically to Kim, so I'm a huge fan of Kim, and that's why he's actually sitting closest to me, so yes. Um, <laughs> that's a very um, young Kim on the cover. <laughs> so, um, but it is a delight to have, to have them here, and I cannot thank uh, the Library of Congress and the Australian Embassy enough for um, listening to me pitch this um, this panel today and they've just they've had unwavering support of this panel for a long time so uh, thank you very much uh, to them for that so Kim Brenton and Janine are unquestionably some of Australia's finest authors um, as I'd mentioned I've worked with Janine and Kim on numerous occasions over the years and I've been become quite close uh, friends with them over the years. Brenton uh, got on my radar a couple of years ago when his first graphic novel of the Ubby's Underdog series um, was released by Magabella Books and I just fell in love with it. Um, Brenton is the first Indigenous Australian graphic novelist and once I knew about creating this panel, I was like, I've got to have Brenton on here and um, we've really clicked and uh, it's been great and I consider him a, a great friend and I look forward to working with him to make sure that his work is promoted more extensively throughout the US um, and worldwide. So, all right, so today you're going to be hearing some award-winning fiction, graphic novels and poetry. So I'm going to start first with some questions uh, for the authors, then we're going to uh, move into the authors actually giving a little bit um, of an excerpt from their latest works, then we're going to have a few more questions, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions as well. So that's the, the kind of format that we're going to have today. So here we go. All right. So, <laughs> so when I know, breathe. All right. So I wanted. Um, I know we've had the official. Um, introductions for all of the authors, um, but I wanted to invite them in their own words to kind of share a little bit about themselves. I wanted them to um, be able to briefly discuss their country, where their um, native homeland is, and what literature and writing generally means to them. So I'll turn it over to you, Kim. Thank you, Belinda. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my dignity here, because my feet don't quite reach the floor. <laughs> so. <laughs> So as you've heard, my name's Kim Scott. I'm, I like to express my identity in the Australian context in this way. I am one of those that call themselves Noongar. That means being from the bottom left-hand corner of the continent, southwest Australia, and particularly along the southern coast, a thin strip of country where the southern ocean meets sand plain and outcrops of granite there. If asked to talk about what literature and writing means to me, um, I'd like to begin with paraphrasing another writer, South American writer, Galliano, who talks about the business of 
sending messages to our many friends who we do not yet know in far away places and embracing them with our language. Further to that, I like the idea that literature among all the art forms is such an intimate form that we collaborate to create uh, interior space where we can meet. And I also, if I'm not going on too long, Belinda, no, I'll good. finish shortly. Um, I also think, if it's not too pretentious, writing for me is very much about decolonisation. Yep. Um, something like the unravelling of supposed certainties, particularly about history and identity, and the negotiating and reimagining common futures and building up a collective in those sort of ways. And of course there is the studied introversion um, of a shy temperament that perhaps suits the writer. Thank you. Thank you. G'day everyone. Um, first, thanks for coming and uh, I was terrified that maybe the whole place was going to be empty but um, no, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of this land. Um, both present and past. Um, so my name's uh, Brenton McKenna, I'm from Broome, WA. Uh, Kim, so I'm literally two days drive north of where Kim's from. So uh, we're, we're from the same state, but it's, it's quite a big state. Um, I think, um, just so everyone knows, I, I accidentally drank the whole pot of coffee to myself this morning. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't nervous until I saw the stage, and now I'm, I think I'm gonna pay for it. So just so you know, I <laughs> seem a bit jagged on stage. Um, there's an explanation for it. Uh, yeah, um, sorry. Uh, I, I'm identify as a Yaru man. My, my mother is half Yaru, I'm half Malaysian. Uh, my biological father, who I've just met just recently, is a Guniani man from the river country, a place called Fitzroy Crossing, which is in the Kimberley region. It's basically the northwest of, um, of Australia. Um, the town I'm from, um, Broome, is very, very multi, not a big town, uh, but very multicultural, um, basically just for pearls. So we're, we're basically the home of pearls. Um, Pintata Maximus, which is the world's biggest pearl, just comes from that one coastline, basically from the Kimberleys down to the Pilbara. Um, and because of that, we had a lot of cultures from around the world just coming to sort of capitalise on the pearl rush, kind of like the gold rush, but for pearls. So um, I've been quite lucky to sort of be exposed to the entire world without actually leaving my town, in, in, in a way, I guess you could say that. Um, uh, and literacy to me, being a graphic novelist, um, it's, it's really strange that people say that I'm the first one. We did our homework, we went and searched, uh, Magabala did as well, and, mm -hmm. and according to like the Australian Society of Authors, they've never had an indigenous graphic. They actually don't have that many graphic novelists at all. Um, uh, th there have been, um, and people that have attempted to, indigenous people who have attempted to do graphic novels. Um, but it is a, it's a beautiful medium, but it's also an incredibly tough one. Um, I did most of it, um, like any graphic novel issue, you're, you're on your own quite a lot, you know. But um, when I look back at it, I'm saying, it's actually, this type of medium really suits us, in, Indigenous people. Um, we're not, uh, from what I've learned as a kid, even sitting around the campfire telling ghost stories, um, and, and seeing sites where our, our traditional uh, paintings are, you know, it's all pictorial. And I thought, you know, it's all in a sequence, just like a comic book, and it actually suits us really well. So it's strange to me that I'm still recognised as the first and the only indigenous graphic novelist where I think, I'm sure there will come a time where there's gonna be more of us, you know? Um, and I really, I really hope that changes. But um, I'm kind of at this crossroads right now where, because I'm the only one, I'm getting indigenous people from all over the country saying, we want you to tell our story, we want you to turn this into a graphic novel. Um, and I, in the most polite way possible, I'm trying to say, do it yourself, you know? But, um, <laughs> like, this, but I can understand why, I know why they're sure. saying that, and mm -hmm. I really hope that changes, so hopefully, mm -hmm. Uh, thanks to the Library of Congress and, and getting out there, I can make, create more of awareness back home and maybe they'll want to change one day. Yeah. Thank Janine? You. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, on whose country I'm visiting and um, also acknowledge um, any other Australians who are in the room and particularly I know there's some other Australian First Nations people here that I'd like to acknowledge. Thanks for coming all this way. Um, Okay, I was born on the completely other side of Australia. I am thousands and thousands of miles and days and days drive away from these two. And I'm from the eastern seaboard. Um, Wiradjuri, I was born Wiradjuri and 
Wiradjuri is means of the rivers or fresh water. Um, I live in the freshwater cradle of Australia. I was born in the freshwater cradle, um, bounded by three rivers, um, Murrumbidgee or Murrumbidgee as they say in English, which means the mother, that's my mother. Um, the Kalar River and um, the Wamboyal River. The Kalar and the Wamboyal River did uh, actually also renamed after a settler, but we still call them Wamboyal and the Kalar. Um, so I was born to a single mother in a town called Wagga Wagga, which means two crows. And um, I came home in 1961. Um, a lot of people, a lot of babies born to single Aboriginal mothers in particular did not come home from hospital. So I had the privilege of coming home with my mother and to um, three generations of women, um, my nana and my two aunties and my mother, or four if you count myself and my sister, who were also under the same roof. Um, so the first bit of country was the first bit of literature I learned to read. Um, and despite the fact that I lived in this part of Australia uh, where every, I come from this town called Gundagai, which is, um, you can check this out online in an encyclopedia. It's had more colonial songs written about that town than any other town in Australia, but not one single one of them are about Aboriginal people. So um, I grew up with these stories of country that were quite different to the folklore and um, it was also an early settled part, invaded part of Australia from about the 1820s onwards. But I grew up with a grandmother who was born in the 1880s who had been raised by women who had first-hand memories of what it was like before white people came. Um, and country was the first bit of literature I learned to read, but I was also encouraged to write and to read white literature. Some of my aunties were domestic servants and they encouraged me to read write white literature so I could understand the colonial psychic because the power, and they can only understand people through their stories. So then I started, and I was encouraged to write from a really young age, being also an isolate, and also being uh, our family quite isolated from the community and shunned. So I write to remember, and also Australia as a settler colony needs to be unsettled. And so I write to unsettle as well. Excellent. So one of the many things I love about this panel today is the diverse genres that are being represented. Um, Kim is here to promote his latest book, Taboo, a work of fiction, um, but one of the reasons that it was so easy to do a companion on Kim is he's also uh, published poetry, he's published short stories, he's worked on TV scripts and film scripts, uh, you name it, like, he's done it all. And, you know, it, it's really amazing, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the beautiful breadth of Indigenous Australian literature, um, how many genres a lot of these authors um, navigate these spaces very successfully. Um, Janine also, um, last time she was here at the Library of Congress, she was talking about her um, book, Purple Threads, and she's here today to talk about her poetry collection. So, and then of course we've got, you know, Brenton with his fantastic, you know, art, artistry, and then also the stories that he's telling. So I wanted to just ask briefly um, with one or two of you if you wanted to kind of jump in and just kind of talk about how empowering it has been for you as a storyteller to be able to successfully share those stories in different genres with your audience. And I might default over to you, Kim, if I can at the beginning, just to kind of put you on the spot because of... Okay, okay. I was going to sh move it around, but all right, we'll, we'll keep, yeah, we'll start, we'll we'll keep ordered. We'll keep ordered. Just for this one. <laughs> What was the question again, Belinda? <laughs> so, the empowering of, of swapping being able genres. To, yeah, being able to successfully swap genres. And I know I'll ask Janine too about that. I don't know if one can always do it successfully. That's because um, part of it is trying about trying to succeed, mm -hmm. uh, reach different audiences, I think, and it involves shaping material differently. And also that business of trying to work out what's what you want to say, and the form varies mm -hmm. that, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's also something in there about playfulness, I think. So it's a range of things like playfulness and opportunity, and, and, and very much about wanting, wanting to reach people. Mm 
-hmm. and that demands the different circumstances, different audiences, different content, mm -hmm. demands playing around with, um, with form, which mm -hmm. is basically what I see yeah. that business of swapping genres yeah. as about. Is that kind of the same for you, Janine, that you found with, you know, going between, you know, the poetry and you know, your other works? And, and prose and mm -hmm. um, essay. Um, yeah, I want to reach as many people as possible. And um, I think, like, the whole genre thing is... I, I understand it's uh, something we live with now, but it's a kind of like a, a Western category and it's a relatively new one. Like, I... Um, tend to see, think in terms of story first. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is the story I want to tell? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that can work better in a poem or sometimes that can work better in an essay um, or sometimes it can work better in a short story of, of creative nonfiction. It's about when you meet different people, you adopt different communication styles. And so I adopt different communication styles depending on what the message is I want to communicate mm -hmm. but also as a writer I think not about genre someone else I'll write something and someone else will tell me oh this is this is what genre it's in mm -hmm. right. okay. yeah whatever if you read it that's cool if, can you read it can you understand it did yep. you get it so yeah yeah okay. but yes it is you're right I do agree that to to be able to now I know what I'm doing <laughs> that people have explained what genre is to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it yep. is empowering to be able to jump across those styles. So enough from me momentarily. What I'm going to do, and this will be the last time I ask them to do it in order, then they can have at it afterwards. But um, in order, I would love to um, invite each of the authors to share an excerpt um, of their work with you so that you can, some of you may or may not be familiar with their works, but th these are amazing. And I know you're just going to be uh, fall in love with them just as much as I have. So Kim, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us. And it's about four minutes, yeah, about four or five minutes. Yeah. The piece I'm going to read all you need to know before I start reading, I hope, is that uh, there is a runaway truck going downhill, uh, goes off the road, soft sand of a riverbed and turns on its side and a couple of people make their crawl out of it. The two of them stamp their feet on solid ground as if reassuring themselves. They listen to the wheels spinning and a luxurious whispering sound, wheat slowly spilling from the vehicle. Come close, closer. A small pile of wheat is growing beside the trailer, fed by a thin grainy spout from the upper corner of the tarpaulin. Golden, it has both the look and sound of great wealth. The tarpaulin slips a little so that the thin stream becomes a golden chute. And then the tarpaulin pulls away like an upside down stage curtain and a wide low wave of wheat makes the girl step back once, twice, three times. She stops, transfixed by something in the trailer as the wheat continues to flow around and behind her. Imagine a figure sitting in a deep and rapidly draining bath. Head and shoulders appear, then the upper torso, knees, in the trailer, beginning with the dome of a dark skull, a figure is being revealed. This figure slides a little, shifts. The tarpaulin slips again. The golden grain continues to flow across the ground. The figure begins to rise. It must be the moving grain, but it seems as if the legs lever it upright and it steps from the upturned trailer and stands swaying with the high weight of its skull. The girl, the figure, they stand facing one another, feet invisible beneath the grain. The wheat dust, the light of the sandstorm, the after effects of the accident, what is it? the girl sees, something like a skeleton, but not of bone, at least not only bone. The limbs are timber, the skull is timber too, dark and burnished, and ivory dentures 
stained as if by chomping, inhaling, gustatory human life, grin exaltation. A gauze of gold dust and light motes swirls from its broad shoulders and around the rippling cage of its ribs. Long shanks lever the pelvis, itself a solid thing of smooth river stone and timber glowing at its centre of gravity. Kneecaps, too, are smooth stone, but the rest is bone and polished timber and woven grass, seeds and brightly coloured feathers and even fencing wire, cords of sinew, of neatly knotted fishing line and, is it human hair? meet moistly at each mobile joint. The figure sways toward the girl, led by the heavy skull, and then glides to her, arms low and open, each beautifully defined and delicate hand held palm up, its whole being as a smile. Hands clasp, firm, warm, uncalloused. And now the wind gathers strength, A melody plays across the visual rhythm of those ribs. Hollowed, meticulously carved spaces begin to whistle and timber limbs begin an accompaniment. Thunder cracks and booms. It rumbles in the riverbed. The figure teeters, begins to move, to slowly fall apart and maybe tumble. Thank you. Uh, awesome. I, I, I'm going to go next, if that's okay, everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm just going to keep my eye on the time, just think, for my own records. Um, because of sort of the intimate format of graphic novels, they're not really suitable to sort of read to the masses, if you, if you know what I mean. It's quite an intimate one-on-one kind of thing. Um, so instead of reading, in, uh, I'm, I'm just going to read the extract of um, just, just the books, if that makes more sense, just to give you an idea what the book's about. Um, it, it only just occurred to me that if I do read the extracts of all three books, you probably don't need to buy them then, so I... Um, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> yeah, you, you there's still pictures. plenty of pictures yeah, in there. You yeah, so, <laughs> hope, yeah, yeah, you haven't got out of it. So, <laughs> I know, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, basically at the beginning of each book, there's, it just recaps what happened in the previous volume. Um, so I'll start off... Uh, I might actually, yeah, start by explaining who Abby is. So Abby's the main character of the book. Abby's on the underdogs. And so the underdogs are um, a group of... Um, back in this is like broom, 1940s, just after the war. It's still recovering. There's still a lot of racial tension and stuff like that. And um, uh, the police presence is almost non-existent. It's, it's almost like a Wild West town. So um, the, the nationalities, the cultures kind of relied on usually about 20 to 30 of its youngest, strongest men to sort of police them sort of thing. So um, police presence, almost non-existent, but the cultural presence of, of like a mini army protected each. So the French, the Chinese, the Japanese, everyone had sort of their own sort of little miniature army that kind of um, kept the peace, if that makes sense. So the underdogs are, are basically made up of guys who couldn't make it in their own nationality, and couldn't make it in their own gang. So um, hence why they're called the underdogs. Um, Abby's the leader. And basically in book one, what happens is they... Uh, um, uh, they meet a young girl called um, Sai Fong, um, straight off the boat from Shanghai. Um, it starts off pretty innocent. They know she's very unwell. Um, but as the story sort of evolves, it, it becomes that she's not just sick and she's actually hiding a humongous secret. So um, I'll take it from there by reading volume two, the story so far. Abby, the hero of our story, has just been through the toughest days of her life. In the dusty, pearling town of Broome, she and a ragtag gang, the underdogs cross paths with Sai Fong, a mysterious Chinese girl, and her guardian uncle, Yip Man Po, as they've just gotten off the boat from Shanghai. After helping Abby and the underdogs defeat a rival gang called the Pearl Juniors uh, at a local game of gruff, it seems that Sai Fong has finally found a place to call home. But when she disappears after a victory over the Pearl Juniors in another challenge, uh, the lives of her and Abby are threatened. The unforeseen circumstances and consequences of these triumphs uh, throw the underdogs into a bizarre world of ancient Chinese legends and secrets, uh, will some simultaneously mounting a rescue mission to save the chess playing Babu. So I didn't explain that. I'll buy the book, trust me, it'll make more sense. <laughs> um, uh, yes, um, convincing Gabe to, uh, no, I've just jumped. Um, 
da, 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 uh, on the eve. There. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that one. So basically, in a nutshell, she's been kidnapped. Um, mm. I think I've just given away the plot. All right, that's all right. That's, all right. that's okay. It's I'll, the pictures. Though. Yes, buy the pictures, <laughs> please. Um, yes, uh, and in just before book three starts, we've got sort of touching on the previous volume as well, the story so far. After a brazen rescue mission to free the chess playing baboon known as Medinga from the clutches of the Don Appletons, it is revealed that Medinga is also one of the last remaining ghost baboons, a mythical species of ape that is able to track and hunt ghosts. Uh, the underdogs were forced to keep on their toes as their search for Siphon becomes more desperate. Using an ancient magical practice, Yip Man was able to see Medinga's memories of the night before. It unveiled that Yip Man's greatest fears as well as providing a central clue to finding Saifong. Looming in the dark heart of Broom Shadows, the secret council of magic also could not ignore the coming danger. Hai was delegated the responsibility to resolve the matter, but as Snow discovered, it was his own master that brought about this new threat. No closer to finding any answers, the underdogs did their best to conceal Medinga's presence in the town now scouring for the ape. They also learnt that Don Appleton's secret agenda, agenda was to use Medinga as payment for services uh, of a hired group of mercenaries tracking down and following a creature even more rare than the ghost baboon. Um, after a close and explosive encounter with the law, Medinga's presence was made aware, sending the town into a fever pitch before uh, he and Yip Man were captured at the hands of this new obscure enemy. During their fruitless search for Sai Fong, the underdog stumbled upon an, an exchange at the port between Hai and his mysterious enemies that were believed to be the Black Guard. Uh, a secret organization committed to protecting China from all threats, both physical and mystical. Uh, but as their meeting turned sour, it was revealed that the Black Guards were being guided by none other than the Hide, led by their treacherous leader, Yuning, commander of the demon cult, hell-bent on hunting and executing Yip Man and Sai Fong. Matters only got worse as the Hide were confronted by the mercenaries wanting to claim back Medinga. Thus ensued a violent battle. Within moments, the underdogs found themselves in the middle of a brawl between the mercenaries and the Hide and now Savannah's pearl workers, so they're guys that work on the dock. Um, the raging battle climaxed with the climactic mix of Abby exercising her new powers and Don Appleton's highly explosive fuel supply. Uh, as the night reached its end, the underdogs and Savannah's men retired victorious over the mercenaries and the Hide. Yet Man also finally met Abby's hardboard mother, Marianne, and discovered very quickly where Abby got her tenacity. That night, Abby dreamt Siphon came to her and told her the whereabouts in a deathly place um, that also has a supernatural bloodthirsty history, a place called Hollow Graves. As the day dawned, it became clear who was caught in the final stage of this grisly adventure and what they were in for. The mercenaries want payment, the gangs uh, are hunting for glory, Don Appleton is craving more power, Yuning and the Hides are seeking uh, for the undead, but only the underdog seek uh, Saifong's well-being. After this day, no one will be left unscarred. Uh, left unscarred. Sorry, um, not Abby, not the underdogs, not even the entire town of Broome. A menace unlike any before has breached the horizon, and now have their feet deep in the sand with nothing else on their mind but chaos. A menace that is closer to ever to throwing the entire world into darkness. Thus, unless the dragons aren't too late. Um, that book's called Return of the Dragon, since the dragon reference at the end. So I hope that made sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sharing mainly from my latest book, Walk Back Over. Um, but I do notice in the bookstore they also have my um, novel, if you want to know any more about my wonderful aunties and nana. Yeah. Um, OK, I've chosen a few poems, and you tell me if I go under the five minutes, and I'll squeeze an extra one in. Um, I talk to my students all the time about the many faces of racism. Hannah uh, Arendt spoke about the banal face of evil, um, while well, I speak about the smiling face of racism. Um, and a lot of people in Australia say they're not racist or that it is only this really rough, uneducated element of society that is racist. And I always dispute that. And uh, this poem is called Spur of the Moment. Um, it's inspired by this person called Professor Barry Spur, who was the former chair of Australian Studies at Sydney University. Um, he was also appointed, handpicked by a former Prime Minister in 2014, who the Prime Minister's name is Tony Abbott, um, 
and he was handpicked to embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives in the school curriculum. And uh, he was caught out by a zealous security guard who was alerted to his email to some suspicious words that were racist on his email. And so they checked his email and found some of the messages I'm going to quote for you in this poem. And the poem's called Spur of the Moment for Barry Spur. It might be tempting to think now, as well-spoken middle-class white Australians would have us believe racism is dead. Swayed by lulls and lilts of political correctness, they are sure there are no barriers for Indigenous Australians now. They might think they've decolonised and dismantled all institutional racism in health, education, justice, housing and employment. Some even sit back and say, we've created a middle class of Aborigines, teachers, nurses, lawyers, politicians, actors, singers, dancers, writers, there's even doctors and dentists, not to mention all the artists and sports people. They're really overrepresented there, aren't they? Don't forget the media. They have their own newspaper and TV station now too. But on the spur of the next moment, we hear a stabbing. Bloody Abo lovers ruining our country. Human rubbish devaluing our property. Retarded people making no contribution to literature. Carved from the corridors of power, heartland of middle class educated white Australia. We know racism is coiling like a scorched snake that slides beneath venomous and vicious, speaking with forked tongue, dangerous and destructive, wearing umpteen respectable faces of evil and deceit suavely like a new designer suit. The next one is called Tracks Wine Back and it's a play on a folk song that's written about the town uh, where I grew up called Gundagai, which means bend in Wiradjuri language. The river takes a big swing there. Gundagai means bend, like bend in the, in, that's shaped like the back of your knee when you run. And there's a colonial folk song that I loathe called There's a Track Winding Back to an Old Fashioned Shack Along the Road to... Yeah, anyway. Um, but this is a poem that plays on that song called Tracks Wind Back. Gundagai means bend, curve, turn in the Murrumbidgee River, edded, eddying and flowing, mother of Wiradjuri children. Settlers, awestruck by your beauty, a garden of Eden, so their stories go, almost undiscovered where Wiradjuri have no wants. They arrived in wagons of wire, tin, steel, guns, disease, poured out concrete over tracks that wound back to the dawn. They couldn't see our memories or hear our stories, our dreamings. They wrote their own histories, Songs of lovers, larrikins, sheep, prophets, droughts, floods, fires, self-made men, stuff of colonial fantasism. They couldn't read the history they built over. Deeper tracks wind back to Gundagai, a long way east of Eden. And... A short one, I live in the national capital. I did live in the national capital. I now live in Melbourne. Um, Canberra, the national capital, is the white fellow spell it like Canberra. But the, it's the proper Ngunnawal word for it is Canberra, Canberra. A short one, in 2013 as the national capital, Canberra turned 100 on the Gregorian calendar. Canberra. Beneath this century of concrete circles, ancient eternal archives hold. Stories, songs, dance, 
history between Murrumbidgee Tides and Brindabilla Peaks, an older meeting place. And so many people think that um, Aboriginal people should only write about Aboriginal things, but we have this, you know, like it or not, uh, white education, white literature, white everything kind of falls on us by default. And, you know, and I've engaged sort of quite happily with a lot of that, but it wasn't by choice. But we can write about other things. In this book, I've written poems for Queen Guinevere, in addition to political things and Aboriginal history of my place. I've written also poems to, you know, Cicero, um, Queen Guinevere, Sylvia Plath, and this one, A Night Song for T.S. Eliot. He walks out every night past the madmen rattling dead geraniums, buys tea, cake, ices, a bunch of lilacs, grasps them in two ragged claws for hands, walks home to the rhapsody of a windy night, stares at a portrait of a lady, writes unsingable love songs, and sits through each moment in crisis, drowns in dreams. And the last one is not from the book, but if you want to read some really good Aboriginal language poetry, jump on Google and hit the Sydney Red Room Poetry, and you'll find a lot of First Nations poetry, and I'm editing a book coming out next year by Magabala Books, who's Breton's publisher, um, which is an anthology of First Nations poets. This one's called, this one's got a bit some Wiradjuri language in it, um, Narumbung Country, not Country Australia, my country, Wiradjuri Country. Narumbung Gully, Country Speaks. It's been too long since I sat on granite in my country and thought. Too many years since I breathed this air. Boninung, Ganyang. Felt this dirt. Namangi, Dahagan. Smelt this dust. Butter, Nibanang. Listen to the sounds of her words that say, Balandaha, do I? Baramali ya, Ningi, Wambai, Yabion. History does not have the first claim, nor the last word. Minghani, Yara, Darabu, Minghani Gingu. You can speak us now. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing those um, exceptional excerpts. I'm going to ask um, one or two more questions for the, for the authors and then we're going to turn it over to you for any questions that you may have. So if you may want to start lining up if you have a question to the microphones there. Um, but for the, for the authors, this year is the United Nations Year of Indigenous Languages. Please share with the audience how important Indigenous Australian languages are to you personally and to the wider community. Anyone can jump in. I won't force you in order. This okay, time. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll shake it up a bit. <laughs> sure, you yeah. go for um, it. I'll go first. <laughs> Languages, look, um, yeah, I went to primary school in the 1960s and despite the fact that everything um, around me had these words, Kulak, Wanabadri, Bathangra, Yurungili, um, you're in Gili, Ilibo, and they're all Wiradjuri, and when I know a story about each one of those places. But we were not allowed to speak Wiradjuri at school. My mother was not allowed, and my aunties were not allowed. Um, the language was sleeping for quite a while, not dead. Um, but it was over about 10 years ago, this maybe a bit more, this wonderful guy called Uncle Stan Grant, um, who was a fluent Wiradjuri speaker, started some language programs in the ACT, Australian Capital Territory, where Canberra is. Um, they went on to write a Wiradjuri dictionary 
Now he's teaching Wiradjuri language at Charles Sturt University. I think the first time I started to learn to speak my language properly was like, almost like being born again. I realised how heavy my tongue was and I wrote another poem like that, which I get to read out, but you know, like how bashed into submission was my mouth and you know, what a slave to grammar and punctuation and um, so it was really, um, I know, something that connected me. I was connected very much with my um, intergenerational relatives, but it's something that connected me, I think, even more. And it was just really liberating to be able to speak. And, I, and working with the Sydney Red Room on a project called Poetry in First Languages, I've worked with many other Aboriginal people working in their first language, which is not my first language, because there's over 200, maybe even 400 languages on their mainland. Um, I can't read them all, but um, when I hear them, I can still understand them, because they do explain country. Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Um, yeah, if, uh, um, language, uh, for me, my interpretation of language, it's, it's kind of, uh, even accents, it's, it's um, greatly influenced by the land, you know, uh, the, your, your language is a reflection directly of where the land, uh, which land you come from sort of thing. So Yaru, um, and, and we, we, we've seen that like the sound of Yaru, um, very low, really harsh and kind of cool sometimes, but um, it kind of suits Broome when you get there and you see the kind of culture there. Um, uh, so, so and, and the same thing as um, uh, Janine, um, that I went to a Catholic school where I was told yeah, you can't speak so any, like, it's, it's strictly English, you know, and they didn't condone it, but they strongly encouraged us not to speak it at home either. They, they kind of said, correct your parents when they can't pronounce, you know, words like, um, things like that. And it was, it was, looking back at it, it was um, really bad. At the time, we thought we were doing the right thing, but um, hence why it led to this whole generation of kids, my generation, almost none of us speaking our traditional language and instead learning bits and pieces of surrounding tribes' languages and stuff like that and then thinking that was our language, you know. Uh, that's changed as of about 15 years ago. We now have a language centre in Broome that teaches to everyone. Um, and since that, I, I think everyone's now feeling like they're part of the land, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And I'd love to see that. I'd really love to see the day where um, non-Indigenous people feel like they have some roots in, in the Kimberley, in, in, in Broome, because they've, um, they're willing to open up their heritage and absorb ours, you know, because it's the land they're currently living on. So um, I hope that day comes, um, and I hope it's sooner than I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, I'd love to do a graphic novel one day completely in language. Um, that's pretty, yeah, the chances aren't lucky, but I, um, <laughs> here's hoping. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is, I think this is a very big and complex uh, question to answer. I've, I've invested it, as have many other Aboriginal people, a great mm -hmm. amount of time and energy in the last couple of decades in terms of cultural language recovery. I'm someone, uh, my ancestral country, at the heart of my ancestral country is infamous for um, historical massacres and the little community living there, my family among them, being full of shame and humiliation and anger and resentment. I think our ancestral languages are very important in terms of healing and in terms of transformation. There's been a lot of research done on the, how the healing works and applies. It's very much about connection. It's been a great joy for me to be involved in as a, as, a, as a literary person, as a story person, in collecting a small community of people surviving mm. our history, and not in a pedagogical way, but with story and song particularly that speaks of country. It's a very endangered language in Noongar, particularly the South Coast dialect, and it occurs to me sometimes how important it is as a major manifestation of the spirit of country, that we have the opportunity to make ourselves instruments of that spirit and remaking ourselves from the inside out, as has already been mentioned, how your tongue 
how you can resonate with the spirit of country through learning a language. And it gives you an alternative other than just uh, polemical, adversarial discourses. The transformation bit, and uh, we've just touched on that just now, I see for a settler colony like Australia, and it may apply to others, that indigenous languages are a major denomination in the currency of identity and belonging. Mm. I'm a little more bristly than Brenton, the generous Brenton, just speaking there, in that I see that's where the potential for transformation comes, in the gifting that to a settler colony and their power relationship being changed therein. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. (laughs) Thank you. Do we have time for just one question? Yes? Yes, ma'am. So, yes, I'm a linguist and I've been working with uh, endangered languages. And also remember uh, back in my undergraduate days reading folklore from a people called the Munkan uh, in, in Australia. I'm not sure they even exist anymore, but it was collected 1930s material that was archived. And I'm wondering, as a potential source of a sort of cultural retrieval, uh, looking at traditional folklore um, as, a, as, as an avenue, for example, in graphic novels, you have source material there that um, this was a nomadic group that was very much a, a sort of animal totems, uh, fascinating uh, material. So just a, a thought, and uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, could we give the, um, the, excuse me, the presenters uh, a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you very much for attending today. I just wanted to remind you that at 11.30, these authors are going to be available in the book signing area, and we would love to you know, have you come up and you know, obviously have them sign books for you, but also get to continue the conversation more. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.